following paid commercial program is brought to you by TD Wealth. Welcome to Money Talk. I'm Kim Parley. Thanks so much for joining us. The U.S. Federal Reserve has once again raised its benchmark overnight rate by 25 basis points, taking it to between five and a quarter and five and a half percent. That is the highest level in 22 years. Now, the Fed has left the door open for more rate hikes down the road. So how high will they go? What are the implications for the markets? Those are just a few of the things we're going to be discussing over the next half hour with Phil Davis, founder of PhilStockWorld.com. Uh, Phil, always great to see you. Uh, I'm thrilled we actually have a good uh, 30 minutes with you today. So let's start off with um, just your reaction to the, the Fed rate decision. It was priced in. Um, is there anything that came out that was surprising? And do you still think there's more to go? I think there's absolutely more to go. I think that's why the markets kind of took a little nosedive towards the close. Um, you know, uh, it, it wasn't so much the statement as what Powell was saying afterwards when they were interviewing him, not interviewing me at a press conference. Um, and he's just, he's just basically saying, look, this fight isn't done. We're nowhere near 2%, which is true for inflation. And until we get there, we're not going to be satisfied. And uh, they're almost certainly going to do another 0.25%. I, I think maybe one more besides that will be right about 6%, which is where we always said it was going to be as far as the Fed funds. And uh, that'll, they'll keep that until they see inflation calming down. How long do you think that'll be? It'll be a long time. It's, that's the other thing people are not happy about because it's not going to bounce right back. In fact, I was, I was writing today in our newsletter, um, people think that the normal Fed funds rate should be 3% or 2% or something like that because it's been that way for 20 years, basically. And the reality is, though, if you look historically, it's more like 4.5%. That, you know, 45 to 5% is the normal Fed funds rate. They're not going to run back to what we do in emergencies right after the, you know right after inflation is even a little bit calmer it's not going to happen hmm. so so given that uh, you know tell me what that sustained level you know whether it's five or six or somewhere in that area is going to do the economy and the market because right now I think you know the s p is trading around 30 times earnings so what what does that uh, mean? Yeah. what does that mean long term well I mean <clears throat> They can't kill this economy right now. It just keeps going and keeps going. It's like the Fed has been trying to knock the economy down. They want a recession or something basically flat that will take the steam out of inflation. But the problem is we still have 9 million unfilled jobs in America. And, um, that, that, and, and, and aside from that, there's a huge amount of wage pressure. You hear about all these strikes going on or potential strikes. They just settled UPS. Thanks. Thank God that would have been a disaster. Uh, but there's, you know, people need more money to live. And until you equalize the wages with what inflation has already been, it's not going to stop. There's still going to be that inflationary pressure coming from wages on up. What do you think is driving all the job growth? I mean, we have some very specific things. I know in Canada, we're seeing a big uh, population growth and immigration, which is really driving a lot of population growth and, and jobs here. But, you know, what is it do you think that's, that's driving all the demand that we're seeing for jobs in the States right now? Well, la lack of supply. I mean, we used to have a million, two million immigrants coming in every year. They put a, basically put a stop to that. It's a very small amount now. Comparatively, one million people died during COVID. I mean, we, you know, we forget that, like, <laughs> It has not been a good couple of years. And then the, and then people who have long COVID have backed out of the workforce. There's a lot of people who have lasting symptoms of COVID. I mean, millions. And, you know, they've taken early retirement and they've also stopped. And uh, low population growth is another problem. I mean, and you're talking about, you know, we act like this is just like a one year problem. This has been building and building for for before COVID since 2019. So we've had four years of this building up. And if you miss a million people a year for four years, all of a sudden you're short four million workers. And then I guess you add on top of that some new demand. You know, we, we look at AI and, and what <clears throat> AI is doing to the to the stock market. There's a lot of hype. You know, we'll have to see if it actually plays out longer term. But there's new demand for more specialized skills that don't exist at the same time. Well, that oh, yeah, there's a huge skills mismatch also. And and that's not helped by a two year gap in education. You know, people don't want to call it a gap. But but, you know, kids working on a, on a remote monitor for two years 
of their schooling for 10% of their school career is not a good thing. And you can see it in the plummeting test scores. And meanwhile, companies still need qualified workers to come out of college. Um, are, let me ask you, though, so let's, that, that's what's happening fundamentally with the economy as you see it. When you look at the market, um, you know, uh, AI is booming, the NASDAQ, uh, you know, way up. Are we, are we in bubble territory, do you think? I think we are a little bit. I think we, we recently did a, uh, last week in our webinar, we did a study. And um, if you look at the S&P 500, there's only about 10 stocks. Um, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, uh, you know, IBM, that are providers of AI, that own AI systems and sell them to others, right? That they're, that they're, they're the people collecting money for AI. Everyone else is a user. 490 people, 490 S&P 500 companies are consumers of AI. They're spending money to implement AI just to be on an even level with their competition. So it's it's a productivity enhancer, yes, but it's also basically an expense. It's like it's like having to subscribe to new channels, right? Like you know, uh, one time we sold everybody the internet. You have to have the internet to be competitive. Now you have to have AI to be competitive. I guess the thought though is, you know, hope you know, from a company standpoint, they invest in AI, but they get some productivity. Maybe there's some other trade-offs along the line, but we'll see. I get your point with the internet; that did not happen. So, uh, in the long term, can I ask you, you know, when you look at the markets now, are you expecting a pullback? Uh, if you are, how much? And are you expecting a rotation into value? Uh, well, I hope we get a rotation into value. That's how we invest. We value investors. Um, you know, it's been a little bit disappointing this year, frankly, considering the amount of the rally, but we've been in fairly cautious stocks. We haven't been chasing anything. We certainly haven't been playing into these 30 times, 40 times AI plays. Um, but I think, again, it's it's bubbly. You know, if you look at Microsoft today, uh, they got a, a lukewarm reception to their earnings. Uh, the, you can't live up to the hype. The hype is crazy. Just like in the dot-com days, you couldn't live up to the hype. People were paying insane amounts of money for stocks, but when they look at the earnings, they're like, well, where's all this magical internet money? And it, it's just not really there. All right, stay with us when we come back. We're going to have more Phil Davis, founder of philstockworld.com. We're going to check in on the Money Talk portfolio. We've got a few stocks in. We've got a few stocks out. And Phil's going to tell us about some of the adjustments made and why. You're watching Money Talk. We'll be right back.